Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. I'm Sam Ploy, and I'm here on the continent to learn about the emerging business scene. I'll be interviewing startups, investors, and organizations who are all playing their part in helping the region develop and grow. And in doing this podcast, I'll be sharing with you the things I learned along the way. There are some ideas that when somebody tells you about it, your first reaction is surprise that there even needs to be a business. I had this reaction about Flare, which is improving how people get access to emergency care in Kenya. Described as an Uber for ambulances, it is consolidating the 50 companies that exist in the country so that there is one place for patients to call to get fast emergency care, essentially making something akin to 999. We discussed the current state of the emergency healthcare market across Africa, the steps process in which they are deploying their app, and educating the population that a service like this can actually exist. It's one of the most interesting conversations I've had doing this podcast, and so I hope you enjoy. Cool. So I'm here with Caitlin from Flair. Caitlin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. So just to get us started, can you tell us a bit about you and a bit about how you started Flair? Of course. So I'm one of the founders of Flair. Uh, the other founder is Maria. And the two of us have been working in the health space across Africa for a number of years. Um, I had worked with the Clinton Health Access Initiative, and Maria had worked with a chain of clinics here. And we both came together because we saw that there was an enormous opportunity in the private healthcare space. Every single year, there's investment going into adding new hospitals and clinics and pharmacies. Uh, but despite the kind of increase in the supply, the consumer or the patient is being left behind. He'll go into these you know, brand new sparkling clinics in Nairobi, and there's actually no one there. And so we saw that there was an important need to bring the patient closer to this growing marketplace. And the first place that we decided to intervene was in emergency medicine, because there's actually an excess of ambulances here in Nairobi, as is the case across many cities throughout Africa, yet there's no equivalent to 911, which is in the U.S., or 112. So that means that it's incredibly difficult to access an ambulance in time of need. It generally takes about about two hours to get an ambulance. If you compare that to New York City, it takes about seven minutes. Um, so there's just so much inefficiency, and we really believe that technology has an important role to bridge that gap between the patient and then this growing healthcare space. Just to clarify, um, ambulances are a private sector business here. We are. So I think that w- that is definitely a difference um, is that there are government ambulances. Those tend to be out in kind of more rural areas and they tend to only do transfers between facilities. So private ambulances are the only ones that exist in number in cities uh, and then also do, as they call it in the ambulance lingo, rescues. So that would be a rescue is anything like a roadside accident um, or a pickup at a private home like a residence or office or any of those trips. That's only done by private ambulance companies here. So if I was to get into an accident, I would have to scroll, go on my phone and scroll through one of 50 ambulance companies and say, and if the first one can't do it, I go to the second one and the third one. Exactly. And that already assumes that you're prepared, meaning that you have the numbers available. I think in reality, most people call a friend. Uh, they don't even think about using an ambulance because of that painful process, because they first have to find the numbers, then they have to figure out which company to call, and then they're sitting on the phone negotiating on price and also have no idea where that ambulance is. Wow. And so these companies, are they all roughly the same size, or are there some bigger ones and smaller ones? There are some bigger and smaller ones, um, but generally they have about five ambulances per their fleet. Um, Some of the bigger ones have like 10 to 15, um, but that's kind of the range that they are right now. I think there's a lot of growth, you know, potential within these companies, but they're kind of at a at a standstill now because they've gotten the demand that they can, but they don't do any of their own marketing. And so as a result of that, they kind of operate and chug along as is. But, you know, they could grow their fleet um, much larger if they actually were serving like a larger portion of the population. And um. Are ambulances allowed to, I mean, do they have sirens? Are they allowed to like overtake traffic and stuff? They are. So I think that that is actually like the biggest question that people ask is like in emerging markets and in Nairobi, which you've probably seen, traffic can be a nightmare. And so, you know, when we always state like, okay, the average time it takes is two hours, New York City is seven minutes, you know, everyone asks us, could you ever really get to seven minutes? 
And the truth is, I don't know, but there's a lot of inefficiency that we believe that we can reduce. And as it relates to traffic, they do have sirens. They look and feel very similar to what the ambulances that you'd see in the U.S. or the U.K. Um, they're equipped with the right personnel, the supplies, the drugs and all of that. So they can go against traffic. But I think the big thing that we'll offer them within the technology is navigation software. They've never used Google Maps and uh, they've never you know, figured out what's the best way for me to get to the patient if it's a private residence or home. And how do I get to the hospital in the fastest possible way? And where is the traffic? And so we do believe that that will help them kind of optimize their route. But right now they have no smart logistics. Um, has there been any attempt to sort of unify these 50 disparate companies before? There has been an attempt by the, the government, and so there is actually technically a line in Kenya. So you could call, and this is the case across actually much of Africa too, there are numbers that you could theoretically call. Uh, so here in Kenya, you can call 999. Uh, what that does, though, is that that links to a police station. The police station, and it's a single line, meaning that if there was ever a disaster or event which necessitated more than one person calling, there's no queue. You know, it's just one phone line. Um, but then that requires that the police actually call an ambulance company, a private ambulance company. So most people don't do that just because, you know, that adds a whole nother step into the system and it really doesn't give you any greater access. So I think from kind of an optic standpoint, it helps because it says, yes, we have an emergency system in place. You call this number. But from a functionality, it really is absent. It, it doesn't do you anything. Um is there any sort of gauge of how many ambulance uh, call outs are made per week in Nairobi? There's no idea. Um, so what we have done is that across the companies in which we're working with, we have estimated, you know, how many trips are they doing? We believe that within Nairobi, there's probably about 75,000 uh, trips done per year. Uh, but we believe that that could grow much, much larger, closer to about 250,000. So that's a significant growth. And the reason that Nairobi would have kind of more emergencies than what you might say in another city is that everyone comes and seeks care in Nairobi. It's really the only mature like health care in the country. So if you need radiotherapy for cancer, if you need a CT scan, you're going to come to Nairobi for care. So Nairobi doesn't just service emergencies that happen here. It services emergencies across the country. Um, some of our ambulance companies actually bring patients all the way from Mombasa. And Mombasa, you know, is by road, I would guess, like at least 12 hours, 14 hours, maybe. I mean, it's all the way at the coast, which seems crazy to me. But I mean, it makes sense when you realize that the concentration of healthcare is here, and so most people come to Nairobi for that help. And, uh, and how many hospitals are there? There's 20 hospitals in Nairobi, um, and across that, uh, I would say the majority of them are actually private. So, will, will your will, will the ambulances be taking people to just public or public and private hospitals? They'll be taking to public and private. The majority of the time, they'll go to the private facilities. Um, so, with the private ambulances, you do have to pay for the ride. And so, if you are paying for the ride, it's likely that then you have the ability to pay for the health uh, care as well. However, that's not always the case. I mean, some of these ambulance companies, they estimate uh, that about 20% of the trips that they do today are write-offs, meaning that when they hear about a roadside accident that happens, they don't ask questions. They go out and respond and take the patient to the facility. In those instances, they'll take the patient to the public facility. So they are for-profit companies. They need to, you know, make a uh, profit and revenue from the patients to stay alive because they have costs on their end as well. Uh, but they do, because there is no one else responding to those cases, if they find out about it, they will respond. And what's the payment like? Do you pay cash on delivery or what, what's, do you pay cash at the beginning or how does it work? <laughs> it's not a good process. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot that can be improved on that end as well. Um, so it really depends on the state of the patient. So if the patient is stable, so because like, for example, you could have broken your leg and you can't drive yourself, obviously, to the facility, um, but you, and you need an ambulance, but you're not in, you know, critical condition, uh, they might ask for the payment right then and there. Now, if the patient's unconscious or in a very severe state, they're not going to you know, force you to pay right then and there. Um, 
but there are, there is a growing number of people that do have insurance and it's insurance that's, you know, either covered by your employer. Very few people buy out of pocket insurance, you know, like that they would on their own buy. Um, but some companies also support ambulance rides as well. So there are some other payment, you know, terms. So it's not always that we're collecting the, um, the payment from the patient directly. It might be from an insurance or from a company, uh, that is paying on behalf of that patient. Um, rough figures, how much does it cost for a ambulance, um, journey? Do you call it, do you call it a journey? What's you the, call it a trip. trip. How, how much does it cost for an ambulance trip? So it depends. Um, but on average, it costs about $55. And that's, um, the average, uh, the spread is, you know, much greater. So it's anywhere from like $30 to $100 within Nairobi. And the spread is because, you know, there's different levels of care that are provided. Uh, for the example earlier, you might break your leg and that they just need to stabilize you and they don't need to give you, you know, intravenous drugs or oxygen or other kind of more critical measures. Um, but then for patients that need an advanced, you know, life support, uh, need to be ventilated en route to the hospital, often those are staffed with doctors. And so therefore those are going to be more expensive and that those are going to kind of push up on that $100. Is it the main variable cost comes in the amount of treatment that you're getting within the vehicle? Exactly. Within Nairobi. Now, if you're going from Mombasa to Nairobi, a big component of the cost will obviously be distance and travel. But in Nairobi, because the number of ambulances as well as the number of hospitals is large enough, we don't think the average trip distance is actually going to be that great. So the majority of the cost actually comes from the actual services provided. Um, so how is Flair going to make it better? Flair is going to make it better by stitching together all of the ambulance companies. So right now they all have their own processes. They have like 50 different lines. And so what we want to do is make sure that they operate on a single dispatch. And so from a patient side, it becomes far easier for me to access an ambulance and I access the ambulance that is closest to me. Um, the way that the system actually works is that the patient, whether that's an individual or a hospital, because hospitals don't operate their own ambulances, they will download the app. Um, once they download the app, it's a very simple interface, but they can see how far an ambulance is from them. So it looks like Uber in that way. They then hit request. And the difference here is like Uber, you automatically get a booking. You know, the, the you know, taxi is en route to you. For us, you get rooted to the dispatcher of that ambulance that is closest to you. And the reason for that is that they need to make sure from a triaging perspective, they give you the right ambulance, that you do actually need an ambulance. Because in any EMS system, emergency medical system, you do have a lot of people that use the system who don't actually need ambulances. So once they do confirm that you need an ambulance, they will then send that request to their ambulance, which has an app similar to like Uber, like a driver side app and they get all of the information on you. So they know exactly where you're located, what condition you're in, and in advance can begin providing care. And there's a lot of cool things that we can do that isn't even in existence in, you know, like the UK or the US where, you know, in route, they can be on video with the patient and stabilize them and make sure that they really understand the condition and kind of do advanced treatment before they arrive and things like that. But in short, what we're doing is we're connecting the supply such that then from a patient side, you're able to easily tap into that. Um, and so that it really should just take minutes to get an ambulance, not the hours that it's taking today. Um, and so will the, the patient uh, or customer, will they have the app or how do they how do they hail an ambulance? Yeah, they will. <laughs> They will need to have the app um, at first. We will be working on a non-app version. The value of the app um, is clear in the sense that I can get your geolocation data. And if I have your geolocation data, then I can match you in the back end with the ambulance uh, that is closest to you. Without having your geolocation data, um, it just makes it much more difficult. I can't speed up that first step. Uh, it just, it's a bit harder. Um, but once we have the non-app version, it would be like a USSD connection, meaning that I would be able to pull what is the cell tower that you're closest to. So the pre precision is not as great, you know, as like if you dropped a pin yourself on a Google map, um, but it does give us good enough information to do that. In order to build the kind of non-app version to get that functionality, we have to work with the telcos. Um, so that's like Airtel and Safaricom who are the major um, you know, providers here that we would have to get them to approve us having that information. 
Um, but yeah, as a patient, initially, you will just need to download the app. It's going to be a really simple app interface. There's not going to be a lot of other functionalities within it, just kind of asking to book the, the ambulance. Um, but then longer term, we'll have a non-app version as well. And um, is Flare for profit? We are. Cool. How do you make money? So we make money similar to Uber in which we take a percentage off every single ride. And so we see that there is a lot of potential for growth in the market. Right now, demand is really suppressed because no one knows how to get an ambulance. Um, so a lot of people actually use Uber or use taxis or, you know, walk um, to the facility. And so we think that there's a lot of growth in the market. And so therefore that allows us to kind of, as the market grows, continue to make money. We are going to be the one similar to Uber that is heavily marketing the service because awareness is key uh, for this. And so that's what we'll be investing in, not only the technology, but also marketing the service to build up the demand so that we take the, the percentage of the rides from the ambulance companies. Um, in, in the UK, um, ambulance is like the state provides it. And the, the idea that I see a billboard for calling 999 is kind of a bit alien. Is there a chance that the government might think, get to a stage where they're saying, actually, this needs to be, we can't have a private company doing this. It needs to be done by the government. And they kind of dislodge you. Potentially, but I see what a more natural transition would be a hybrid, a public-private partnership. So if you look at the U.S., it's a public-private partnership. Oftentimes in certain municipalities or counties, the government will contract it out to a private company. And maybe that's a whole phys uh, ideological debate about public versus private service. But I think the reality is here is that, and it could be potentially an explanation, is that the government has not had the resources to actually provide this service to date. And what we're doing is we're carving out the population that can pay for the service such that then hopefully we'll be able to identify who are the individuals who cannot pay for the service and the government could step in there. So rather than say you need to provide you know, emergency services for all 44 million people in Kenya, we could say these are the individuals that you know the private companies will provide and so that it's a tiered system. And so those that can pay will pay for it and those who cannot pay cannot. Uh, and will be provided by the public. I think the big thing is, is that we want to make sure that if there is a two-tiered system, that quality isn't different between the two. You, I mean, from not only like an, an ethical standpoint, like I think everyone deserves, you know, a certain level of care if they have an emergency. Um, but for the foreseeable future, it will be you footing the bill for the billboards. It will be us. Yeah. Um, where's your investment coming from? Where's your funding coming from? We've had two phases of funding. Our first phase of funding came from, uh, we cobbled together some prize money from MIT where I did my MBA, uh, as well as Merck, the pharmaceutical company, as we are part of their accelerator. So that got us just off the ground uh, and got us to you know do all the necessary research as well as uh, prototyping for the product. Uh, we just actually closed a round with angel investors, which is a combination of American as well as Kenyan angel investors for our pre-seed round. And then we'll be raising again because uh, we're constantly fundraising uh, towards the end of this year for our seed round to go commercially live. When do you uh, expect to get your first sort of paycheck from a um, from first paying customer? So our ambulances are going to be the ones that are actually remitting the money to us because that's how we're making the money is we're taking a cut from every single ambulance ride that's booked through the app. Um, so we expect that we'll probably start tracking revenue uh, beginning early next year. So we do have a soft launch um, that we're gearing up for towards the end of November. Uh, that will be just to um, put the system in place with the ambulance companies. So there won't be a consumer you know, part of the app yet. So it's like if Uber went live on the back end, where all of a sudden the taxis were better organized and coordinated and, you know, knew where you were. But from an individual standpoint, you didn't have the ability yet to download the app and request. And so we think that there will already be kind of pretty significant improvements around logistics and time to patient care. Um, but we will not start clocking revenue until we actually have the patient requesting via the app. Um, has there been any resistance to what you're doing? Yeah, I'm sure that there will be. I think that um, we've been lucky in a lot of regards. So from the beginning, we've been working with the ambulance companies here. And we realized that that was kind of number one um, kind of variable to our success is that 
we don't plan to own and operate. I am not an EMT. I'm not a paramedic. I do come from a health background, but I am more of a business and a tech person. Uh, so we don't plan to own and operate ambulances. Thus, we heavily depend on these ambulance companies because without them, what's the point of the technology? Um, so we've been working with them from, from the beginning. Uh, and one kind of really interesting kind of tidbit about them is they're all friends. All of the companies or the ambulances here, whoever operates and owns them, they're all friends. They all, about 10 years ago, worked together uh, in the first class of EMTs here in Kenya and realized that there was a big opportunity in providing emergency response. And so grew, you know, similar companies and are competitors, but they're friendly competitors. Um, so they all know each other and they know what they're doing. I think that the tension or the kind of friction that we'll have comes later on once all of them operate under capacity. But as we build demand, that demand's not going to be equitably distributed. It's not as if all of these, you know, six or seven companies that we work with, if we increase, you know, by 70, they're not all 70 rides. Not each of them, if we have seven companies, they're not each going to get 10 more rides. Some of it's going to be how well do they use the data that we give them? How do they figure out where they should actually be placing the ambulances in the cities? How do they make sure that they maintain quality and keep costs at a minimum? Um, so there are going to be things that really will determine who kind of owns the market. And I think that there likely would be some consolidation later on. Um, has this type of platform or business model um, been adopted in any other countries in the world? The only other places, there's a lot that is happening around emergency medicine. Uh, I don't know if it's because of, you know, the fact that it's a very dated city a system in most countries. Um, there's actually a really good John Oliver clip on it. I'll have to send it to you, but uh, I don't know if it's because it's just so outdated or because of Uber and the fact that you can get a taxi in, you know, seconds, minutes, um, that like, you know, people are now starting to question, why can't I have a scene functionality? So there are startups in the U S, um, that we've been tracking. And then there are startups in India. Um, the Indian ones are actually farther along. And I do think that that's something interesting to think about is that within emerging markets, uh, it's both it's harder in some regards, like it's harder to raise money and it's harder to build the initial networks. But the advantage is, is that there's no pre-existing system. So I don't have to unwind something and re-engineer or kind of, you know, tinker with an existing system. I have nothing. So we can kind of build from the ground up a better system that you know, overnight can actually leapfrog over what, what we have in the U.S. or in the U.K. Um, what are some of the other ways that other countries have, have, um, have tried to solve this problem? Or is it just that they, is it, is it typical in most cities for them for there to be lots of small private, privately owned ambulances? And it, apart from India, who's got this platform? Um, what, what are other ways of solving the problem? Most of it is just that it's consolidated. So like in the U.S., there's like two to three big private ambulance companies. And so that um, helps because from a contracting perspective, when the government decides to contract out those services, they're only working with, you know, a very small set of trusted providers. Um, but also those trusted providers then have the, qual have the quality standards needed because they also have the economy of scale to invest in equipment, the personnel, and do all of that. And so in most markets, you don't see the same fragmentation that you see here, whereas everyone owns a little bit of the market. And so I think that that has made it even more challenging here because if there are only two companies to call, I don't think our solution would be, it's still very like valuable in the sense of giving you tracking and doing you know, payment integration and adding other cool features, but I don't think that it would have the same immediate value because you could just call those two companies and figure out which one had a closer ambulance and kind of negotiate with them. But I think because there's so many different ambulance companies here, um, there's just not a good system to access them. And then also because there are so many, no one really understands the difference between them. Are there differences in quality? Are there differences in price? And so from that you know, perspective, we think that we're doing a lot in making it far more transparent as well as organizing the market such that then you as an individual actually want to tap into that. So the other countries or places, it's just much more consolidated versus here. Are there any other, I mean, just are there any other, company, any other countries that have a similar market structure to Kenya? It's in lots of small ambulances. 
You see that? So we've started to actually explore, you know, as part of like starting this venture to say, is this a problem that's unique to Kenya? You know, and we thought, no, but like, let's make sure that we really validate that hypothesis. And so we've started to look in Uganda as well as Tanzania and in the cities there and similar structures. You have a number of different private providers, each of whom have a few ambulances that they run and operate, yet there's no kind of single system. Uh, we also have looked at Nigeria and they have, you know, way too many. I mean, it's not even six or seven. They have, you know, upwards of 50, you know, ambulance companies that are operating in, in Lagos, the largest city there. So why haven't countries in East Africa and Nigeria, why haven't they consolidated? Then one of the things that we heard, at least from the ambulance companies when we were talking to them, because that is like an obvious question, why don't they create it? So these companies are not tech companies. And so, yeah, it seems like it's a straightforward tech solution, but they don't have the capacity to develop it individually. But I think the more important thing is, is that you almost need an outsider coming in to stitch together and, and be a neutral force because we're agnostic to which companies we're working with, so long as they have quality, you know, ambulances and are outfitted with the right, you know, equipment and supplies and personnel. Um, but we're neutral. We're not, you know, affiliated with one company or the other. So I think that that has been seen as like a very positive thing because they don't want someone from within developing it because then they feel as if like it's going to be biased to one of the companies. So. Um, what's been the biggest sort of surprise or thing or learning that you've had since you started? The biggest learning that I've had since starting is just like how much we have to make Kenyans aware that a system, you know, does now exist. I think that if you ask most most people in Nairobi, you know, they, they sit there kind of perplexed and they're like, that's a really good question. How do I get an ambulance? And they look to their friend and they start thinking like, what would I do? What would I not do? Um, and I think just the kind of because there's no system and I mean, people travel all over. And so they realize that systems do exist in the UK or the US or elsewhere across the globe and probably in most countries across the globe. But because there's never been a system here, um, it's just been so surprising for me to actually ask that question and just watch as people like think through, you know, how would they get it? And like very few people would ever say I would call 999. Most people would be like, I think I would drive myself. And I'm like, even if you're having, you know, a heart attack, maybe. Or what if you're pregnant and about to deliver a baby? You know, some people will be like, oh, I'm going to take an Uber. And it's like, really? That's how you would go? So I think that there's just so much that we have to do about awareness. It's not just going to be like once we have the app, all of a sudden everyone's downloading it and using it uh, because also you don't have an emergency every day. You have it, you know, kind of once every 10 years, maybe. Um, so I think that awareness is going to be essential because people understand that a system should exist, but no one, you know, realizes, you know, today that there could be a better way. I mean, often, you know, when I think about when I downloaded Uber, it was, you know, with a group of friends saying we need to get an A to B. Someone was like, oh, download Uber, do it right now, right here, right now. Um, I can imagine in the fray of an emergency, downloading an app is not the first thing on your on your mind. And what's your plan around getting people to sort of download this app? Because it seems that you've got this, you don't have the, I'm in the moment, I need to solve the problem, I'm going to download the app. How do you get people to sort of, Pre, you know, predict that they're going to need it. I think one is just making people aware ahead of the time that this service does exist. We can't have people do like beta tests, though, like go on an ambulance ride and see whether or not it works. But one is awareness. I think the other is just making sure that it is a really simple app and it's a small app to download, so that it's not taking a you know a lot of your uh, storage space on your phone and it's not something that you just lead right away. But other things that we're doing is we're working with uh, the telcos here to see whether or not they can pre-download the app. It is a critical service, and so all new phones could have the app on it. The other thing is, I don't know if you've seen on your iPhone or even Android phones, you have an emergency button. That button could link for us to a web-based browser version of the app so that you don't actually need to download the app. It just links to that so that you, we get your geolocation data, you hit request, and then you immediately get on the phone with the dispatcher that has the ambulance. So there are other things that we're thinking about because that's definitely top of mind is that the last thing that we want someone to do when they have an emergency is to waste time downloading the app if they could have called someone to get uh, I think kind of fast forward, once we do have that non-app version available, that will allow us um, 
to kind of move away from maybe the app and have people just call directly, but we still get the geolocation data, which helps us pair you with the right ambulance. Uh, we'll just do a few more questions. Sorry. Um, what do you see as the biggest risk to Flare um, being success? So a, a few. I think one, we need to be really smart about how we market. So if you look at a macro level, if you were to quantify and crunch the numbers, a number of emergencies, it makes our business model make sense. There are millions of emergencies. We estimate there could be anywhere, you know, just shy of 100 million emergencies in Africa. And I mean, it's a big continent, but, you know, that's a lot of emergencies um, that happen. But at a micro level, as I was saying, like it happens really rarely, an emergency. So we need to be smart about understanding which are the populations that we should pay more close attention to. Um, not that we will only market to kind of young individuals, which you tend to need ambulances kind of if you look at your lifespan towards the beginning and towards the end, because uh, those are your most vulnerable years. And so how can we make sure that those are the individuals that are, you know, in the system? So obviously a baby's not going to download the app, but you need to have their parents have the app. Um, so we need to be really smart about understanding the demographics of emergencies. And that's a very unknown, you know, thing in this market about who are the individuals that are experiencing emergencies, but then our marketing does need to be kind of tailored to that. So I think that that's kind of one big risk is that from a numbers perspective, there's plenty of emergencies, but how do we make sure that we actually capture those emergencies in the system and get people who have those emergencies to actually get um, into the into the ambulance? I think the other one, which is obviously um, definitely logical when you think about it, but it's liability is that we're not just taking a pay, uh, we're not just taking like Uber, a person from their you know, private residence to their office or to a restaurant, you know, to go out to dinner with their friends. We're carrying an individual who maybe they're not in the most critical state or maybe they're in a very critical state. And so we need to make sure that the ambulance companies that we're working with have incredibly high standards. Um, and if there are ever any issues that they, you know, are not allowed to be on the platform. And so that vetting is essential because that's also a big thing from a user standpoint. We need to make sure that people realize that these are quality providers and we vetted them and that they trust in the, the services that are being offered. So I think that that definitely keeps me up at night is the whole liability piece is making sure that you keep all the incentives aligned such that, you know, these ambulance companies are pro providing the highest level of care and quality of care that they can. And, uh, and how can people listening at home follow the story of Flair? What's the best way to, for them to sort of see what you're up to? The best way is to follow us on our blog. Um, uh, we do have a website as well, um, but our blog is blog.capsule.co.ke. And we update um, or we have updates regularly on kind of our progress to launch, as well as I try to put out thought pieces on emergency care because it's such an undocumented space here. Um, we often try to dig into a specific issue, you know, every couple of weeks, whether it's like how many numbers exist in, in Nairobi that you can call for emergency help or what are the companies that you could call to, you know, give a face to these companies. Um, so we're trying to expose some of the, the issues, but also some of the dynamics of the market here. So that's the best way to kind of get, you know, updates on us as well as learn more about the emergency space. Cool. Well, Caitlin, thanks so much. Thank you. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see the show notes for this episode by heading to samfloy.com forward slash podcast. That's S-A-M-F-L-O-Y dot com forward slash podcast. This show is still relatively new, and so I really appreciate you making it through to the end. What would be great is, if you're enjoying it, to tell a couple of your friends about it too, in case they'd also be interested in giving it a listen. Also, if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please feel free to email me, podcast at samfloy.com. I'd be happy to chat. In any case, have a great week and speak to you soon.